today. And I want to thank Stavis for arranging this and Jeff. It's really been a wonderful experience. Um, I uh, think one thing that's going to be a little different about this presentation is that all the other presentations are relevant to you professionally. I think this presentation has the potential to be relevant to you both professionally and personally because um, unless something really amazing happens in science over the next few years, all of us are going to die. And all of us know people and will know people who die. And that age-old question, what happens when we die, is um, addressed, answered, at least partly, uh, better today than it was uh, in ages past because of research on near-death experiences. And so near-death experiences really came into the Republican professional awareness in 1975 <coughs> with Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life. Uh, Moody was a, a medical student and uh, he has a, both an MD and a PhD. And he had observed this phenomenon among the patients that he had worked with. And, uh, and actually a friend, a colleague of his, was the first to tell him about a near-death experience. And um, and really wrote this book. How many of you have read Life After Life? Has anyone read it? No, yes, good. Okay, and I know that some others of you have uh, done, uh, I know Tizzy, she's not here yet today, but she had done some research on NDEs already and was aware of them. And undoubtedly you've heard about them in the, uh, in the pop, uh, popular literature. One thing I know, I was just telling Status, I've done research with um, um, college students and with near-death experiencers themselves. And from both of those sources, what uh, comes out is that all the information that's out in the popular literature about near-death experiences is not filtering down to people so that they really know accurately um, what, real, what NDEs are and what um, happens after them for people who have them. So um, these kinds of presentations are still relevant. Um, in fact, in the media, I think that NDEs have become cartoonized. Um, the idea that you know people move through the tunnel and to a light, and that's what an NDE is. And actually, that's quite inaccurate um, from the scientific research. So um, um, in 2009, uh, well, I should say in 2006, um, several um, well, I organized the leading researchers of near-death experiences from around the world to compile chapters on particular topics uh, like the contents of near-death experiences, after effects, um, characteristics of near-death experiencers, uh, explanatory models of near-death experiences, and so forth. And it was compiled into a book the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences. I noticed that uh, this, this is uh, actually in the silent auction. Is Roberto here? Roberto? He has the highest bid so far on this book. I noticed so that John also bid on it. So if John, if you are here and you don't get the book, um, I'll send you a copy. <laughs> um, but if you really want to read uh, what research has shown, um, this this book compiles the findings from over 65 studies of over 3,500 near-death experiencers in the U.S., Europe, Australia, and Asia, uh, addressing both the experience and after effects. And um, so as of 2005 or 6, that was the, the um, research base. So it's a pretty good basis upon which to um, draw some generalities about your death experiences. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Do you want to say anything to say Well, I'm very, very excited uh, about uh, this opportunity that this conference has brought to me because I know John for several years. We were both through email and we've actually done two times uh, Google publications. We have seen us publish something in the Handbook of Safety and Life Saving, which I edited in 2008. And then we wrote the review article a few years ago that was published uh, uh, last year, 
think in the Spanish magazine journal. So now we are here and hopefully this will be meaningful to you as much as this for me. And we are ready to start. We're ready to start. So, can you just hold on for one second? Yes. I have done it already. I 
was endeavoring to fasten her alongside the ship to one of the scuttle rings. In foolish ignorance, I stepped upon the gunwale. The boat, of course, upset, and I fell into the water, and not knowing how to swim, you all cringe, right? Um, all my efforts to lay hold either of the boat or of the floating skulls were fruitless. The transaction had not been observed by the sentinel on the gangway, and therefore it was not till the tide had drifted me some distance astern of the ship that a man in the port top saw me splashing in the water and gave the alarm. The first lieutenant instantly and gallantly jumped overboard, the carpenter followed his example, and the gunner hastened into a boat and pulled after them. With violent but vain attempts to make myself heard, I had swallowed much water. I was soon exhausted by my struggles, and before any relief reached me, I had sunk below the surface. All hope had fled, all exertion ceased, and I felt that I was drowning. So far, these facts are either partially remembered after my recovery, or supplied by those who had laterally witnessed, uh, yeah, laterally witnessed the scene. For during an interval of such agitation, a drowning person is too much occupied in catching at every passing straw, or too much absorbed by alternate hope and despair, to mark the succession of events very accurately. Not so, however, with the facts which immediately ensued. My mind had then undergone the sudden revolution which appeared to you so remarkable, and all the circumstances of which are now as vividly fresh in my memory as they had occurred but yesterday. Now this is another feature that's very common of NDEs. The person will say that no matter how long ago the NDE occurred, it's as vivid in their memory as if it occurred yesterday. And another thing I want to be sure to tell you is that because you're going to be hearing people talk about NDEs that did occur many years ago. Um, one of the, well, the leading researcher of NDEs, Bruce Grayson, did a study once, a, a longitudinal study of NDE years <clears throat> from um, 20 years before, um, who he contacted again, they were in his research pool, and asked them to again describe their NDEs. And then he did a content analysis on the description that they gave today to the one they gave 20 years ago. And he found there was not only no significant difference between the descriptions, so unlike our normal memories that fade and we lose details, NDEs remain vivid and clear. But actually, if there was any difference, it was that the, the um, ones today had a little bit more detail, like people had remembered a little bit more over time. And so um, it's very opposite of what happens to our normal memories that degrade over time. From the moment that all exertion had ceased, which I imagine was the immediate consequence of complete suffocation, a calm feeling of the most perfect tranquility superseded the previous tumultuous sensations. It might be called apathy, certainly not resignation, for drowning no longer appeared an evil. I no longer thought of being rescued, nor was I in any bodily pain. On the contrary, my sensations were now a rather a pleasurable cast, partaking of that dull but contented sort of feeling which precedes the sleep produced by fatigue. Though the senses were thus, thus deadened, not so, my, not so the mind. Its activity seemed to be invigorated in a ratio which defies all description. For thought of gross for thought rose after thought with the rapidity of succession that is not only indescribable, but probably inconceivable by anyone who has not himself been in a similar situation. The course of those thoughts I can even now in a great measure retrace. The event which had just taken place, the awkwardness that had produced it, the bustle it must have occasioned, for I had observed two persons jumping from the chains. Now, I want to make a note about that. Here he was suffocating in the water. He said he wasn't paying attention to what was going on because he was, you know, grasping and then suffocated and sank below the surface. But he saw two people jump from the chains. So that indicates that his, his consciousness was functioning apart from his body. The effect it would have on, most, on a most affectionate father, the manner in which he would disclose it to the rest of the family, and a thousand other circumstances minutely associated with home were the first series of reflections that occurred. They took then a wider range, our last cruise, a former voyage and shipwreck, my school, the progress I had made there, and the time I had misspent. 
and even all my boyish pursuits, pursuits and adventures. Thus traveling backwards, every past incident of my life seemed to glance across my recollection in retrograde success. Not, however, in mere outline as here stated, but the picture filled up with every minute and collateral feature. In short, the whole period of my existence seemed to be placed before me in a kind of panoramic review, and each act of it seemed to be accompanied by a consciousness of right or wrong, or by some reflection on its cause or its consequences. Indeed, many trifling events which had been long forgotten then crowded into my imagination and with the character of recent familiarity. May not all of this be some indication of the almost infinite power of memory with which we may awaken in another world, and thus be compelled to contemplate our past lives? Or might it not, or might it not in some degree warrant the inference that death is only a change of modification of our existence, in which there is no real cause of interruption? But however that may be, one circumstance was highly remarkable that the innumerable ideas which flashed into my mind were all retrospective, yet I had been religiously brought up. My hopes and fears of the next world had lost nothing of their early strength, and at any other period, intense interest and awful anxiety would have been excited by the mere probability that I was floating on the threshold of eternity. Yet at that inexplicable moment, when I had full conviction that it already crossed the threshold, not a single thought wandered into the future. I was wrapped entirely in the past. Now that is not characteristic of every ending here, but it was true for him. <clears throat> the length of time that was occupied by this deluge of ideas, or rather the shortness of time into which they were condensed, I cannot now state with precision. Yet <clears throat> certainly two minutes could not have elapsed from the moment of suff suffocation to that of my being called up. The strength of the flood tide made it expedient to pull the boat at once to another ship where I underwent the usual vulgar process of emptying the water by letting my head hang downwards, then bleeding, chafing, and even administering gin, that's at the time. But my submersion had been really so brief that according to the account of the onlookers, I was very quickly restored to animation. My feelings while I was returning were the reverse in every point of those which had been described above. One single but confused idea, a miserable belief that I was drowning, dwelt upon my mind, instead of the multitude of clear and definite ideas which had recently rushed through it. A helpless anxiety, a kind of continuous nightmare seemed to press heavily on every sense, and to prevent the function of any one distinct thought, and it was with difficulty that I became convinced that I was really alive. Again, instead of being absolutely free from all bodily pain, as in my drowning state, I was now tortured by pain all over me, and though I have been since wounded in several places and have often submitted to severe surgical discipline, yet my sufferings were at that time far greater, at least in general distress. On one occasion I was shot in the lungs and after lying on the deck at night for some hours bleeding from other wounds, I at length fainted. Now as I felt sure that the wound in the lungs was mortal, it will appear obvious that the overwhelming sensation which accompanies fainting must have produced a perfect conviction that I was then in the act of dying, yet nothing in the least resembled the operations of my mind when drowning then took place, and when I began to recover, I returned to a clear conception of my real state. If these involuntary experiments on the operation of death afford any satisfaction or interest to you, they will not have been suffered quite in vain by yours very truly, F. Beaufort. So, an Irish, uh, an Irishman's NDE. So, on we go, and um, the um, Near Death Experience Research Foundation is one of the two major websites for information about near death experiences, in, in my view. Uh, that website is operated by Jeff Long, who's an anesthesiologist, and his wife Jody Long. And, um, this is the source of the next account that you're going to hear that Status found uh, from their um, archive of, of people entered their NDEs online. And um, so they have an archive that they um, will give to researchers. So I contacted uh, the owners of this uh, website and they were very, very kind of 
frankly, happy to share all the NDE drowning related stories uh, with us. So I tried to find one that will be the most representative and include as much information as possible. It's quite lengthy, but it shows very, very clearly most of the, the common features of the phenomenon. So, this uh, uh, young lady, Lisa M, says, My near-death experience occurred when I was five years old in Russia, where I was born and lived at that time on a holiday trip to the Black Sea, where I went with my mother and grandparents. On this particular day, we had all gone down to the beach. The sea was rough and my mother was standing in the water holding me in her hands. I remember feeling safe and secure, although the waves were huge, enormous from my five-year-old perspective, and being excited as they come crashing over my mother and me one by one. When this particular big wave hit us, my mother lost her balance, lost her grip, and I was washed away by the wave. For a moment, I felt the utter fear of death, my body instinctively sensing this being a life-threatening situation. I held my breath and struggled to find something to hold on to, to save myself, but my hands were only grasping water. Only water was everywhere. I was helpless, completely out of control. When I realized there was no use to fight, nothing to get a grip on, I surrendered. I let go of my breathing, let go of trying to save myself, let go of the struggle for life, and allowed whatever was happening to me to happen. Next thing I remember is feeling the most profound and utter sense of peace I ever felt in my life. Suddenly, I was feeling completely safe, being enveloped and protected by something I can only describe as complete unconditional love. This love was all around me, it was everywhere, but at the same time, it was also me, the one I was, my innermost essence. There was no longer any fear, no worries, no struggle for anything, and I couldn't have gone on this being going on being wherever I was and feeling the way I was forever. I felt as thought I was finally being my true self. There was no limits or limitation whatsoever. I could go wherever I wanted, know whatever I wished, do anything. The sense of freedom was inexplicable. I was also strangely aware that the thing was we, we ordinarily call time now was suspended and no longer existed. Then I was swept away by some unknown force and started to move at an enormous speed which felt a lot faster than the speed of light. I traveled an enormous distance, literally traveled beyond the world. I didn't have any sense of having a body, just of moving like a thunderbolt through a darkness toward a point of brilliant light in the distance. And as I came closer to this light, my only desire was to get to it get to where this light was. When I reached the point of light, I found myself in a world of light. Everything in this place was made of and radiated light. It was beautiful and radiant beyond expression. Heaven would be an adequate expression, but I have no religion, religious feelings, and knew there was no such thing as a hell. I knew, without knowing how and why I knew this, that this was the place where everyone eventually got when they died, regardless of who they were and what they had done during their lives. In the middle of the light stood a male figure. It was radiating this light and radiating this totally unearthly, complete, unconditional love. I was embraced by this being or enveloped in its light, which felt like an embrace. Suddenly, I remembered this place. This was my home. The place that was really my home. And I wondered how I could have ever forgotten about it. I felt as though after a long, difficult journey in a foreign country, I finally had come home. And the being of light who was there before me was the being that knew me better than anyone else in creation. 
The being of light knew everything about me. It knew all I had ever thought, said or done, and it showed me my whole life in a flash of an instant. I was shown all the details of my life, the one that I would have already lived, and all that was to come if I returned to earth. It was all there at the same time, all the details of all the cause and effects relations, effect relations in my life, all that was good or negative, all of the effects of my life on earth had had on others, and all of the effects the lives of others that had touched me had had on me. Every single thought and feeling was there, nothing was missing. And I could experience the feelings and thoughts of all the other people involved myself, almost become them, which gave me pure experiential understanding of what brought other people pain or joy, the positive or negative experiences and effects of my own actions. The being was not judging me in any way during the life review, even though I saw a lot of shortcomings in my life. It simply showed my life the way it had been to me, loved me unconditionally, which gave me the strength I needed to see it all, the way it was without any blinders and blinders, and let me decide for myself what was positive, negative, and what I needed to do about that. I don't remember any details of the events that were shown to me, neither past nor future, but I remember what was most important. The being of life showed me that all that was really important in life was the love we felt, the loving acts we performed, the loving words we spoke, the loving thoughts we held. All that was made, said, done, or even thought without love was undone. It didn't matter. It simply did not longer exist. Love was all that was really important. Only love was real. Everything we did lovingly was as it was supposed to be. It was okay. It was good. And the love...
No time in the usual cell existed there, here. Neither did the concept of space, but even so, there were different places to go and spans of time that passed by. This is a contradiction in terms, but it is the only way I am able to explain it in words. In words. Spaceless space, timeless time. In this place, there was only put being. Except being healed, I don't remember what we did, just that we were together and enjoyed it enormously. I remember this world of life as being huge and enormous place, a place without limits or borders, neither individual or external. I remember all beings who were in the place with <coughs> complete total knowledge about all and everything. It was all pleasant, loving, beautiful, beyond expression. Everything and being in this place was made of light and everything was light. Even though there were individual things and beings, the light is what I remember best. It was living. A life. A living light that was everything and all. The essence of everything and all. Next thing I remember is suddenly find myself back in the presence of the being of light I would met first and told I had to go back. I said, no way, I won't do it. This was about the last thing I wanted to do. Life on earth, filled with darkness, pain, sorrow, limits and limitations, was like a horrifying prison compared to this wonderful place. And I simply refused to go back. I was told that it wasn't my time, that I would be granted a visit back home, but that I had to fulfill my purpose and do the work I myself had chosen to do on earth. The being of light reminded me that my purpose was to learn about love more, compassion and how to express them on earth, and that my work was to help other people in any way I could. I had chosen this myself. And he told me that I would be back in the world of life in no time. Never forget, in reality there is no time, only eternity. Itself, it said. Next thing I knew, I was back feeling my body, the way it washed me up on shore again, and I was crawling up the shore, cutting out a lot of sea water. As a child, I forgot my near-death experience, and the memory of it didn't return until many years later. Even so, it has always been with me and given me strength to cope with difficulties in my own life and to help and support others. During the whole of my professional life, I've been working with helping others in different ways. At the age of 18, I started working with elderly people, dying, senile, physically and emotionally ill people. I work with people with AIDS and mentally ill. Later on, I work in the mental health care and social care area among people with psychological, social, existential, emotional and spiritual difficulties and always felt my work has been deeply meaningful even before remembering my near-death experiences. Currently, I'm also working as a psychosynthesis therapist which is a branch in transpersonal psychology. The near-death experience also put the foundation to my lifelong interest in the paranormal, the mystical, the unusual, and the spiritual, which I have had for as long as I can remember, not knowing why, for many years. It has made me explore unknown dimensions, it made me seek and find the answers to many questions, and to constantly strive to learn more about life, death, and everything in between, and to seek out ever new ways of helping others which for me is the most meaningful things one can do in life. In the end, the near-death experience taught me as much about living as about dying, and it keeps doing so. So that's the story, and we are ready now to listen to anyone. I, uh, I was at the uh, 2012 conference of the International Association for Near-Death Studies just a few weeks ago, and, uh, of course, we've heard from a 
and talked with many other people who've had near-death experiences. I thought in light of Stathis's, uh, this case that Stathis had found of a girl who had a drowning experience at the age of five, you might like to hear a contemporary uh, person who's, um, who had a drowning experience at the age of five. Um, this is Neil Helm, and he recently retired from a rather high-level <coughs> position in the space industry. And uh, which he'll allude to a little bit in his description of himself. And uh, I interviewed him on my iPhone, so here's uh, Neil. So, Neil, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview. And as you know, I'm going to be presenting at the uh, Irish Life Saving Foundation, and you had a near death experience I think would be of interest to them. So, um, maybe you could begin by telling us. Uh, who you are today? Thank you, Janet. I'm uh, pleased. Uh, today, as in every day, I, I begin my day as a child of God. So I get up and I say my prayers and I talk to God and I praise Him and uh, thank Him for a good night's sleep and for the things I'm going to do that day. And then I proceed to my day. Space scientist, the whole career was, was largely in aerospace. Although I, I, I had a lot of other very interesting uh, side aspects of my life, I was a lay pastor for a number of years. Uh, when I retired, I went back to being a student. I finished a master's degree in transpersonal studies at the Bank University in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And um, who were you leading up to your near-death experience? Where I was, I, I was uh, five years old in 1944 in Montana. <coughs> we went to visit with Mark, who was a physician in Rosemary, Montana. And then we were on our way up to a TV sanitarium that she ran up in the mountains of Montana. And this would be like Play with some friends. 
friends in a backyard swimming pool. And um, what happened, he was trying to impress the girls there, so he, dove, he went into the shallow end and um, swam the length of the pool underwater, came up in the deep end, and his friends thought it would be funny not to let him um, break the surface. So they were there pushing him down with their feet, sitting on the edge of the pool. And he said he sank down, he clawed his way up to the top. They were still there, they pushed him down again. He sank down again and then he stayed. And he said that um, at the moment that he stopped, and he also commented that he did not really have very good swimming skills, so he shouldn't have been doing this to begin with. But all the conditions were there for drowning. So he said that as he was um, lying there in the bottom of the pool and just knew that there was nothing to do but inhale water, he said it was, um, he was just terrified at the thought of having to breathe water. And this is the moment at which um, he continues with his story. The moment the water starts going into my lungs, I am engulfed by a white light. And I, I, I mean, it's instantaneous. It's like when I'm face down in the pool, that's like I'm looking up kind of like a 30, 40 degree angle going into this light. And in the interim, I have this flashback of my life up to that point where uh, all these good moments start rushing through me, like eating a, a, a fried bologna sandwich my mother made. Um, you know, we'd go grocery shopping in New York, and we'd come home, and my mother would take the fresh bread out and fry some bologna, and, make, and we'd eat it. And I mean, a little, like five years old, and I remember this. And, and uh, even younger than that, I'm in the backyard, and it's spring day, and the grass is really green, and there's flowers, and I'm spinning, you know, looking up at the sky, and just being a little kid, you know, and these moments are just flashing through my mind, and, and then, you know, I, I'm in the light, and I'm, I look down, and I'm actually, there's, there's nothing below me, I'm just, it's just there's nothing there, I'm just floating, and I look at my arms, and the light is actually particles, they're not, they're, it's not like, uh, like light, like it's actually particles streaming from this one source, and I can see them uh, permeating and going into my soul. These little particles, and they have like streams coming, and, and I'm like, wow, this is cool. I'm thinking, this is great. I mean, I, just, I would have been terrified to the next second. I am making bullets and thinking, this is just well, I don't even care what it just happened. I'm just happy to be here. And I come to this point where there's 12 individuals that I can't see because the light silhouettes them, and it's just people standing there. And I'm thinking, I'm just standing there, just soaking up this. This is just wonderful. I just like it. And, uh, and it, it comes out of the center and to me, and it, as it's called, I realize, wow, oh, that's, that's Jesus, Jesus Christ. You know, that's, that's God. <laughs> And he's got these blue eyes, and he's, he's got long hair, white robe. And it's just like, wow. And, and I'm, I don't come from any type of religious background whatsoever. We didn't go to church or anything. So it was just very odd that I knew who this was. And I knew his name, and I had always known who it was. And he, he came to me, and he grabbed me by the wrist and told me, uh, without verbalizing it, but it, you know, intuitively, he said, you you got to go back, you got work to do. And I remember opening my mouth to object. <laughs> no. And at that moment, I'm back in my body, like being born again, uh, on the side of the pool. And I open my mouth, and what's coming out of it is water. So, um, oh, what, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I didn't keep another, uh, the next like minute or so, where he describes that um, he, you know, regained consciousness, normal consciousness, and he essentially got up and ran home at 
spent the next two days alone in his bedroom. And um, you know, his mother would ask what was wrong, and he just couldn't talk about it because the experience had been so overwhelming and so unexpected um, that it was just difficult for him to integrate as a 12-year-old in the 70s before near-death experiences were even known um, through Moody's book. So, um, um, so that's his is one more case. Here's uh, Cheryl Mackin. And um, she was uh, at, again, at a conference of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. Uh, every day of the conference, we have an experiencer panel. So there will be four near-death experiencers, and there's an hour during which they'll each tell their story and then answer questions. And they describe their NDE and after effects. So here is Cheryl, and we're just going to hear the audio. And at that point, I decided to become a doctor so back to school and became a doctor. My second near death experience was uh, in March of 1996. I had come out here to Hawaii to um, visit with a friend. We had um, been trying to swim with the dolphins. And uh, on this particular day, we had kayaked out. We were on um, um, Kailua and Wani Kaili, and we had kayaked out to the far Lua to cliff climb. We were cliff climbing around the ocean side of that island, um, and we were very high up. That particular place, the waves come in from two different directions. Like the feeling that you have when you're a child and you go up in 
13 years ago, Dr. Mary Neal was kayaking when she said she went on a miraculous spiritual journey. In her bestseller, To Heaven and Back, she writes about how she drowned, went to heaven, and met with angels, but was ultimately sent back to her body and her family with a very powerful message. We'll talk to her in a moment. But first, here's NBC's Kristen Dahlberg. It was a day of kayaking down a remote Chilean river. Dr. Mary Neal says she never imagined where it would take her. I had young children, I had a full-time job. I was really sort of too busy to be thinking about my spiritual life. That's when Neil says she got a crash course. The spine surgeon, who was an admitted cynic, says she died. Her boat was pinned under the rapids, and she became trapped by the rushing current. I was out of air, and I was too far from shore for anyone to see me, let alone come and save me. Neil was with her good friends, experienced whitewater rescuers Chad and Tom Long. When they noticed Mary was missing in the rapids, they followed safety protocol and started a watch. It was more than 15 minutes later, they saw her take a breath. Did you think she was dead? Yeah. No, absolutely. While she was still underwater, Neil said she felt herself peel away from her body. I was absolutely overcome with this physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured. She says a group of spirits were there to greet her. Not only did these beings explode with this incredible love, but they took me down this exceptionally beautiful path toward this sort of great dome structure of sorts. But she was told it wasn't her time. I was sent back to share my story. And she was told her family would need her because her oldest son, Willie, was going to die. I didn't know the details, but yes, I knew that that was going to happen at some point. Ten years later, when he was just 19, Willie did die after being hit by a car. I'm not going to pretend like I don't wish he were here, but I'll see him at some point. After Willie's death, Mia published her best-selling book, To Heaven and Back, to share her story and her new perspective. As the doctor who thought near-death experiences could be explained by science until it happened to her. I know that there is life after death, and I absolutely know that the promises of God are true. There's no doubt. For today, Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, Horseshoe, and Idaho. And Dr. Mary Neal is with us this morning. There's a, there is a follow-up interview, which you can find if you're interested, um, by Googling her name, Mary Neal, and Today's Show, and um, see the, the interview. She talks a little bit more about the entities that she saw, and, um, and her, uh, one, of, one of his questions is why she thinks she survived when other people die. And she essentially said, heaven only knows. So, okay, so I think that is it for our, um, uh, yeah, so what do you think an NDE is? No, no, I don't know. Pardon me? Oh, okay. I can't, I, this is, uh, I like to be more interactive, but I can't be because the video camera is stationary. So um, I'm interested to know what you think in your death experiences based on what you've heard so far. What, what would you say at least is part of the definition of an NDE? Anybody want to <coughs> jump in? Yes, the, there's a feeling of profound peace. It's very common. Mm -hmm. What else? Well, people seem to leave their physical body. 
physical, their physicalness is left, and their yes. essence of their spirit is there, but not no longer a physical body. Yes, yes. So their essence, their spirit, soul, consciousness, whatever word you want to use, is functioning apart from their physical body, independent of their physical body. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, that there's this very, uh, almost universal, uh, that the person has an experience that, that includes light, and that the light is somehow alive, it's a, a being, an entity, an energy, a, um, a consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. Anything else? They've all described being cold back. Yes, the, um, actually what research shows is that about half of people um, return without uh, anticipating it. And um, it's just like they're going along in the NDE and suddenly it just stops in midstream and they're back in their body. And um, the other half either are sent back uh, against their will and some people really struggle with the uh, with being back here, uh, having been sent back against their will. Unlike you heard some uh, one of the NDEers say that even though they they were told they had to go back, they realized that they had actually chosen to be here to do work. And um, but not everybody uh, gets that sense. Some people really just do not want to come back and they just are sent back against their will. And then um, the rest of the people actually choose to come back, but not in the way that we would think of choosing exactly. It's more like um, what happens is the person is thinking about staying and then thinks about a relationship, one or more relationships, but usually it's a relationship with one person in which there's, it's a loving relationship where there's still something to be done, like this person needs me. It might be a child, a spouse, a, a brother, a sister, a friend, it could be anybody. But at the moment the person has this sense that, oh, there's something more to be done, boom, they're back in their body. So it's not a choice like, oh, there's something more to be done, let's see, shall I go back or not? It's the moment that love intention um, occurs, they are back. So, um, and, but they feel, th those people tend to feel better about being back because <coughs> in a sense they chose it. Anything else? Question. Yeah. Do you have NDEs on record which are not related in any way to drugs? Oh yes, absolutely. They're, uh, drowning NDEs are only a minority of, of them. They occur in all circumstances of um, a close brush with death. So, um, uh, of course, cardiac arrest is the most dramatic because um, if the person, once the person's heart stops beating, uh, within 20 seconds or so, there's no um, discernible activity in the brain, and uh, it doesn't mean that um, activity couldn't be occurring below the surface of the brain, but in terms of EEG, there's no discernible activity, and yet people are having these um, lucid, detailed, um, uh, uh, deep experiences. So it uh, contradicts our uh, expectations of what would happen when there's um, loss of blood flow to the brain. Um, so, and they happen in car accidents, um, just all kinds of things. But of course, for here, for this conference, we are focusing on drowning and DEs because they are most um, relevant. But as you'll see here when we get into some of the specifics that Status found in his um, analysis, um, the features that you'll hear are characteristic of features of, in all circumstances. So well, here's um, a um, definition of NDEs. Uh, they're reported memories of profound psychological events that occurred during a special state of consciousness associated with an episode of actual or threatened physical, psychological, emotional, or spiritual death. 
So, so even though we're talking about actual physical close brushes with death, people sometimes have these experiences in um, circumstances like meditation or um, um, even experiences where, they're, where they feel the possibility that they could die, but they're never actually close to death, such as in actually some of the earliest published NDEs were uh, mountain uh, climbing accidents where people fell. And just from the moment their feet left the ledge or wherever they fell from, to the moment their body lands and they never lost consciousness, maybe weren't even seriously um, injured. But during that fall, they report being out of their body, watching the fall, being absolutely at peace and, um, uh, and unconcerned about their uh, physical well-being. So it's, it even occurs in cases, in conditions where the person was actually never in any physical danger and didn't lose consciousness. So it can occur while the person is physically unconscious or not. And um, in, uh, it also has occurred in uh, surgery. So while people are uh, anest deeply anesthetized, being monitored uh, for um, uh, any um, brain activity, uh, that while all that shows that nothing is going on, the person is out of their body watching um, what's happening in the surgical room. And um, that the experience contains certain common paranormal, transcendental, and mystical features. So to, um, essentially, I like to think about NDEs as having two general components. One is the material component, where the person's observing the material world. And the other is the transmaterial component, where the person is perceiving um, environments or entities that are not of the material world. And um, even though those seem like they're separate, and in a lot of NDEs, there, there really is a separation. Like, first the person's out of their body watching what's happening usually around their physical body, but they can travel to distant places as well. Um, and then moves uh, through, that this is often where the tunnel or uh, movement through a void or or space of some kind occurs, and then the person's in a transmaterial environment, actually the two things can overlap. So for example, uh, when I'm giving my NDE 101 lecture, uh, which is very different than this, uh, I use extensive excerpts from a gal I interviewed uh, named Tricia. And in her NDE, which occurred during surgery, she flatlined during surgery after a severe car accident where her back was broken in three places and they didn't expect her ever to walk again and she's just all well because she was healed in her NDE. But um, in the first thing that happened, she said she popped out of her body and, um, and she said, interestingly, she, she um, left her body a few seconds before the monitor registered that she was flatlining. So she actually saw a couple of blips and then heard the monitor flatline. And then uh, she said if she, her first, very first reaction was fear, like, oh, and then immediately she saw these two uh, entities. She said they were quite tall, maybe eight feet tall, and they um, were, um, uh, she said they had an intelligence that was beyond anything she'd ever experienced. She was 20 at the time that this happened. And she said they would turn and communicate to her through light uh, from their eyes. And the, all this information was coming to her. Well, at one point, she said they turned to her and essentially said, like, watch this. And then they turned, oh, first they sent light into her to fill her spirit body that felt very healing. And then they turned and they said they were each standing behind the two surgeons that were working on her, each of them behind one of the surgeons. And they sent light into the surgeons' bodies, filled their bodies with light. The light came down through their arms, through their fingertips, and filled her physical body. And she said she knew when this was happening, that this was all about healing, and that she would walk again. And she saw her physical body filled with light, and, um, and she knew that she 
So um, the point that I'm getting at here is that um, in her case, the material and transmaterial domains interacted, and that sometimes happens in, in NDEs. So, um, um, and the other aspect of the definition is that NDEs are followed by certain common after effects. Now, I, I purposely left those off here for the moment, uh, for the most part. But we'll talk about those um, in some detail here. And I think, yeah, so this is fast. A part of my interest of your near-death experiences and drumming, as most of you know, I am a sports science physical educator. So I would like to ask you to stand up, to stretch your body for a few seconds. That will give us the strength to continue fresh. And you can move your body yeah, right and left and drink a little bit water. And that will help us to continue. Uh, in 2000, uh, until 2005, many books and about uh, 700 general articles have been published. studies uh, that have taken part in the United States, in Asia and Australia. That involves, as just previous, previously said, 3,500 uh, near-death experiences. And uh, these study both the experience and the after-effects of the people. The incidence of near-death experiences among survivors of a close brush with death include um, are uh, dealing with uh, are dealt in 35% uh, in these re retrospective studies and 17% in prospective studies which is a reasonable estimate that we have one in every five I, yeah. the, um, I didn't realize this part was coming um, the, the point of this uh, you probably know the difference between retrospective and prospective research, but just in case you don't, a retrospective study would be where, let's say, I put an ad in a newspaper and say, if you have survived a close brush with death, I'd like to interview you. And a prospective study is where I set up in a hospital and decide that for a year, I'm going to interview everybody who survives cardiac arrest. And so the studies actually sample people in different ways. Um, and that's why the, um, the incidence is, uh, is different. But if you kind of average the incidence, um, what, what I think is the um, probably best estimate is that out of every five people who survive a close brush with death, one will, ex will report a near-death experience and four will say that they remember nothing from the close brush with death. So it's quite normal to remember nothing, and it also is normal to remember something. And, um, and that, I think, is uh, important in um, having, for health care providers, expectations to know that the majority of people will remember nothing, but uh, maybe 20, maybe 25 percent of people will uh, report a near-death experience of some kind or another. Now, NDEs range in depth, and so there could, for example, uh, one gal who I am about to interview um, was in a car accident where her car rolled over five times. And she said from the moment the tires left the ground, she popped out of her body, she watched the car roll over and over, saw people running toward it, and when the car finally landed and got settled, she was back in her body. That's all. No light, no tunnel, no entities, no flash forward of her life, no life review, just an out of just, an out of body experience. And then you hear these uh, very elaborate NDEs where the person goes to various um, levels and um, sees a lot and interacts with entities and so 
so forth. So those are relatively deeper experiences. So um, yeah, the estimate is based on all near-death circumstances and the specific incidents for drowning-related NDEs we just don't know. But in the absence of, um, of empirical data, it would probably be safest to assume here, too, that about maybe one out of five people who survives a drowning will have had a near-death experience. Now, Stathis was telling me that um, there's the estimate of drowning rescues worldwide is um, 500,000, like a half million a year. So, at least a half million a year. So if you divide that you know, by 20%, um, um, somewhere between 100 and 125,000 people a year have the near-death experience, as best we can extrapolate. So that's a lot of people. Okay. Now, it's really good. Okay. So let's see what, what we did about uh, drowning-related uh, near-death experiences. We analyzed about uh, 35 cases that uh, we found available in the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation website in May 8, 2006. And the process was that uh, there were uh, responders that answered close-ended questions with option uh, for making some narration. They indicated a near-death experience and they scored at least seven on Grayson's near-death experience scale, which is an instrument that uh, we use in order to indicate whether or not a story contains ND features. So the people that responded were 54% uh, males and 46% females, so it was almost half-half. 66% of these people had a, a college or university education and 34% of them had a lower education. 97%, which is almost the whole sample, were Caucasian and three Afro-Americans. The religious affiliation at the time of the NDE was 26% liberal, 14% moderate, and 23% conservative or fundamentalist. Uh, we had also 14% Christians, and 9% uh, Methodists, Catholics, and Pagans. 14% of the sample did not answer this question. In a life-threatening situation, well, when we ask the people, did you experience a life-threatening situation? Almost seven people out of ten responded yes, and about, about two out of ten people responded no. Fourteen percent of the sample was not sure. Uh, when we ask them if they use medication or substances with potential effect to experience, which is something that many, many people of, often use as arguments, saying that this was the effect of the medication that you, did, you, you have taken, you have dreamt it. So, several, several people, 75% yes, and 23% were not sure or did not answer, and three people said no. The overall emotion tone, most of the people said that it was a wonderful experience. 26% said that it was a mixed, wonderful and frightening together. 6% said that it was a frightening experience. And 11% expressed, well, did not answer. So here, this, it is very, very interesting for us, as aquatic safety professionals to know that only 6% of the people say that this is a frightening experience. When I was writing my PhD about drowning, I used to use extensively a reference that said drowning is possibly the most extreme and horrifying uh, way of death. Until I 
came across to this incident and I realized that it might be frightening until the moment and then after that moment it becomes a wonderful experience. So this is very, very relieving for us to know that if we were unsuccessful the person did not suffer as well as a very good uh, way to make the relatives feel comfortable and support them psychologically. Don't, don't worry about your relative because it wasn't as painful as you might believe. Research shows that this is a nice experience. A, a, well, it's not a painful experience. The emotions that were felt during NDE were 74% positive. 6% the people felt every emotion or mixed emotions. Uh, only 6% were nervous and 14% did not answer or they felt no emotions at all. In terms of level of consciousness, the people felt that 91% were alert because there are people that are unaware about NDEs and they usually say you were not alert, it was a dream. It wasn't really what you believe it was, but they say that I was 91% alert. And only a very, very small percentage, the people were not alert or they weren't sure. Was it a, a, a dream-like? No. Slightly, but very small percent. And people felt it was like a dream only in 11% of the cases. So you see, those that have this unusual, very, very interesting experience, they are able to make a distinction between a dream and the experience and they say in most of the cases that it was not a dream. For the question of whether the person was separated, uh, the, the consciousness of the person was separated from the body, they said that yes, it did happen. A small percentage said that they were not sure or they were uncertain and only a small percent they said that the consciousness did not separate from the body. In terms of outer sense of space or time, again, almost one out of two people responded positively, only 29% negatively, and 23% were uncertain. Okay, question to you now, so we can make it a little bit more interactive. For the question, did you see or visited beautiful or otherwise distinctive locations, levels or dimensions? From what we have just shown you with the narrations, what do you believe that they answered? So just give me a number. Did they see or visited beautiful places? What do you believe they answered? They thought they did. They thought they did. Yeah. So almost half of them, they did. Small percentage they didn't, and even smaller percent they are not sure. Okay, this is a famous painting of Hieronymus Bosch. My accent is Greek, sorry, but it shows the, the tunnel, and more than half of the people did not experience the tunnel. 26% they did, and 20% are not sure. But when we asked them, did you hear any unusual sounds? Again, 26% they said yes, 60% no, and some people were not sure. So what we see often, like what John said, that near the experiences are recognized, and we see the tunnel, and this is happening, it doesn't happen in all the cases. So that's why we say that uh, to consider a story as near-death experience, it needs to have at least seven from the Grayson's scale, seven features. So when we ask them if they met a life, what did they say? Give me a number. How many of the people indeed met a light? Seventeen. <laughs> Oh, Joe, well done, well done. How many did they say no? It will take 1% on the 26? 
and 6% were not sure. When they met other beings, give me a number. How many of the people met a, a being? Other beings? Half of them. Half of them. What the hell? <laughs> UK, UK has a very good representation in this conference. <laughs> yeah, and 40 percent of the people did not meet anyone, and 11 percent were not sure. Uh, did they become aware of future events? Give me any numbers. How many of the people said yes? 15? 69. They said no. They said no. So 29, they said yes. And few people, not sure. Uh, do they have, do they knew uh, any special knowledge or universal order uh, or another purpose? 60% they said yes, which is very, very interesting percentage. And the other people said no. I've heard so many stories about the people uh, they, they, they get out of their body and they're floating above their body. And I know now that I need to explain, but because the UK representation was so responsive and uh, participated to the questions, I will tell you in Leeds Metropolitan University, where I, I, I was I'm, I'm working, a friend of mine who was working in the sports center went to the bus stop across the street and he was kicked heavily from a group of young people and then he came out of his body and he was looking down the people that were kicking and hitting him and he saw a body down uh, and around there was a lot of blood and he said this is awful whose is this body and then he realized that it was his body and then he was in the, in the ambulance his grandmother said, it's not of your time yet. And he stayed in coma for several months and then in the hospital for two years and then he came back to the sports center to work, to work again. His name is Daniel. If you go Daniel again in the, in the sports center, dark hair, Daniel. So, um, the people reached, did not reach a boundary or a limiting physical structure in most of the cases, but they did in 20% of the cases. So one out of five people experienced this. And uh, whether it was a decision to return to the physical body, uh, it wasn't their decision in most of the cases, which is what John said that sometimes, well, most of the times, well, most of the times, they don't want to go back. They have to. The light, the beam says it's not your time yet. And if you go in Google and you write Jim Carrey Jacuzzi lifeguard, you will see a really funny video of Jim Carrey trying to help someone who is supposed to be drowning in a jacuzzi. And Jim Carrey shouts, No, it's not your time yet. So this is a, a humorous approach of what I'm going, what I'm what I'm saying now. But in most of the cases, the people do not want to go back, to come back. Uh, when we ask the people whether they observed or heard anything that could be verified later, in over half cases they said no, but interestingly, in 35% of the cases, they said yes. And let's see now what after effects we had in these cases. The people found the experience difficult to be expressed in words in half of the cases. And this is something that we saw in the narrations that um, we heard earlier. Uh, in all, oops, yeah, that's correct. In almost half of the cases, it wasn't difficult to express it. Well, this, is, this must be wrong. Something fast is wrong, you can't my, my statistics. So my frequencies, sorry. <laughs> this is why I don't get published all my articles in my channel. <laughs> this, ex this explains things. <laughs> um, the people share the experience.
experience with others in most of the cases. Uh, and in a few cases they did not respond or they were uncertain. Did their lives change specifically because of the experience? Yes. This is very interesting. The experience did not leave a trauma on the person's life. In most of the cases the people became aware of something and they were more positive about uh, loving, learning, being useful until their, their time to return back to this home will come. Um, are there any changes that increased over time? Yes, in over half of the cases. Uh, and in other cases, uh, they remain stable. And in very, very small cases, uh, the changes increase, decrease. Are, are, do we have any changes in attitudes or beliefs? In most of the times, yes. So you see now that the positive responses for whatever we ask that is meaningful and, and really uh, positive, it's always represented with a very, very high percentage. And uh, whether we had any psychic, paranormal or other special gifts after the experience, not prior to the experience, most of the, well, over half of the people said yes, almost 60%. This is very, very interesting percentage as well. Only 31% of the people said no. And did the experience affect the relationships, the daily life, the religious practices and the career choices? Because we, we saw in some days that some people were not religious prior to the incident. So almost, almost 7 out of 10 people said yes. It changed my life. It uh, affected my relationship and my career choices. And only 29% of the people said no. And overall, uh, quality of changes uh, after the experience, uh, it was a very, very positive. So that's good. This is, as I said before, a very positive thing to use as argument for the relatives of the people who have missed someone. 20% was mixed and 3% only was negative or disturbing. So remember this. Most of the people said that the overall quality of changes only 3% was negative. Subsequent life event, medication or substance that reproduced some part of the experience. Was there any? What do you think? I want to hear voices from other countries. Spain. Seventy-one percent said no. So you see again that good messages are extracted from these questions. Twenty-nine percent yes. So the view of research on near-death experiences reveals that immediately upon returning to usual waking consciousness, the near-death experiences uh, emotional reactions can include uh, exuberance, anger, confusion, or fear. Uh, near-death experiences, disclosure behavior can range from in sense talking to profound silence withdrawal. So, to conclude, am I concluding? Or you? I don't know, that's, that's oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, the takeaway for people who are experiencing near-death experiences is that drowning-related NDEs can occur under any circumstance to any drowning victim. Uh, we have research certainly has not indicated um, who, in fact, in general, near-death research, um, we don't know um, why four-fifths of people who survive a close brush with death remember nothing and one-fifth remember an NDE. There's no, we have no, um, all the research that we've done has not found any um, distinction between those two groups. So we just don't know why some people remember NDEs and others don't. But life-saving professionals can expect that some drowning victims they rescue have had an NDE, in, in, in essence, maybe one out of five. That drowning-related NDEers may or may not remember NDEs 
is to their rescuers. And if they do, they may struggle to describe <coughs> the experience. There's a word in the near-death literature, ineffable, that um, Stavis was referring to before, that most NDEers, in my experience, say that the experience cannot be described in human language. Human language was developed to explain this reality, not another reality. So it's very difficult. And there are all these paradoxical things, like it's timeless, yet things happen in a sequence, and there's no space, but there are these different spaces. So these kind of things, our language just isn't, um, wasn't derived to explain. And um, that reported drowning-related NDE, NDEs will often, but not always, contain certain features. So they might or might not contain the out-of-body experience, an encounter with life, a life review, um, encounter with deceased loved ones, um, all, uh, any, I, I like to think about NDE as the same way I think about faces. There's deep structure and surface structure. So if you look around the room, there's a deep structure to everybody's face. There are two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and a particular configuration. But every face is unique in terms of the size, the color, the shape, the um, relative relationship. And similarly, near-death experiences reveal a deep structure, but every NDE will be unique. It will be a unique combination of features, and, um, and even the features themselves will, will vary from one experience to another. Um, so in the next part, the second part, we'll address indications that a rescue drowning victim may have had an NDE and the importance of how a life-saving professional invites and responds to disclosure of an NDE and best practices in inviting and responding to NDE disclosure. So um, here are some references. Um, we can make this PowerPoint available to anyone who's interested in it. Um, Stavis found this wonderful um, quote. Yeah, because it's not very obvious at the screen because of the light, I can read it. Seeing death as the end of life is like seeing the horizon as the end of the ocean. Dave Searles. So, oh, so, uh, let me have uh, just seven minutes until 10.30, which would maybe be a good time to break. Um, uh, we go until 11.30, so we'll, we'll take maybe a 10 minute uh, break after questions and discussion, and then do the second part about life saving professionals' responses. So, um, what questions do you have or comments? I'm guessing you may have a lot, but I don't know. I'm very skeptical. I always am. <laughs> yeah. I just think most people will have some element to that, and you just don't know about it. That what the answer in here? She's always skeptical. She has heard stories, mm -hmm. but she's not sure whether these are real and Janet can believe them or not. Yeah. Hmm. I think everybody, yeah. to a certain extent, will have some of that. Uh huh. Uh huh. I think yeah. this is a good time now because very often when I'm reading about these stories, the more deeper in knowledge I'm, I'm, I'm going the more I believe that there is something here, believable. But when people from the audience say, well, it is a play of the, of the brain, and I know that there must be an answer, scientific answer, that proves that this is not the case. And sometimes people say, well, you have dreamt something, it's not real. And I know that there is answer, scientifically established, that proves that this is not the case. But I don't have all the answers because I'm not that experienced in near-death experiences. But Jan is more experienced, so why are you so skeptical? Give us a good reason, and possibly Jan will be able to say, no, this is not truth because of that and that. So what makes you skeptical? Only because I think that most people will have some part of that experience at some time. Um, if you uh, are about to crash your car, then everybody describes a, you know, a scene all their life before them. 
And that's uh, what you're describing is just an extension of, of that. You know, if you think life's going to end, and all of a sudden you think of all the good things, all the bad things, everything that's happened in your life. And everybody does that. These are just a few um, experiences uh, that have been a bit deeper than that. Mm -hmm. So certainly the life review is a common feature of near-death experiences. It actually is not the, um, it doesn't, most near-death experiences are much more than that. Uh, like meeting deceased loved ones, meeting spiritual entities like Jesus, um, um, and going to environments that are non-material. And they happen, uh, sometimes they appear to be happening while the person's brain is not functioning. So I think that's what, one of the things that is compelling about these experiences. Um, another aspect that we haven't gotten very much into is veridical perception. It's an aspect of NDEs that I've been, uh, ever since I began researching NDEs and for my doctoral dissertation in 1988, uh, this has been one of the real interests of mine. Veridical perception is where the near-death experiencer the, based on the condition and position of their physical body, they should not be able to perceive things that they do perceive and that are later shown to be accurate. And these are the cases are especially interesting where the, um, what the person perceived either violated their expectations or just was nowhere in their field of expectation or um, was some, and was something that really could be explained physically. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in one case, a man uh, had a near-death experience during surgery. He flatlined. And he, while he was out of his, subjectively described being out of his body, he saw his uh, surgeon, he said, flapping his arms as if trying to fly. Now, a researcher was called in to interview um, him and everyone who was in the operating room, ending with the surgeon himself. And what the researcher found was that to a person, when he would say, um, you know, patient so-and-so said that during the surgery, when he flatlined, he was out of his body, he was watching from above, and he saw Dr. X flapping his arms as if trying to fly. <laughs> Can you, you know, enlightened me on this. And the person would go, and they go, oh, oh yeah, Dr. X, yeah. Um, yeah, so what he does is he walks scrubs in, and to keep his hands sterile, he puts them on his chest. He backs into the surgery room, and then he stands there, and while all the preliminary stuff is being done, he just waits until it's his time to be involved, and then he takes his hands down and, and begins his work. Well, what happened here was that before his time came, the patient flatlined. So he was saying, move that car, get that scalpel, do this, do that. He was flapping, excuse me, flapping his arms as if trying to fly. Now, what's interesting about this is that the patient was there with his eyes taped shut, and he, it, the surgery was such that he also had a, um, a tent over the uh, top half of his body. So there's no way that he could have physically seen that. And there's, I don't think this makes enough noise that even if he hadn't been deeply anesthetized and dead, um, he would have heard that. So it appears that the only way he could have known this, and it wasn't something people talked about, and the physician himself confirmed that that's, that's what he does, um, it appears that his consciousness was, you know, apart from his body. Um, the gal who I use in my NDE 101 uh, uh, lecture, Trisha, uh, in her near-death experience when she, she was flatlined in surgery as well, and she um, left the, at some point, she left the surgery room, went into the waiting room and saw her mother and her biological father. They were divorced, but they were standing, or actually her mother was literally on her knees praying in the waiting room. Her father was standing beside her. And Trisha thought, where's my stepfather? You know, the, her mother's um, husband of a couple of years.
years. And the mo as happens in NDEs, the moment she thought that, she went shoo, through the hospital to a, a distant corridor where she saw her stepfather putting coins into a candy bar machine and vending out a candy bar. Now, what was surprising to her, even at that moment of observation, is that her father was a health food nut. And she had never seen, she said, if I ever saw him eating refined, or if he ever ate refined sugar, it was in secret. He just did not eat sugar. But obviously, this is a very stressful situation. Trisha's, you know, been in this horrible car accident. She's in surgery. They think she's not going to be able to walk. And so he goes for comfort food. After the surgery, Trisha regains consciousness. Only her mother is there. And she begins by saying to her mother, I saw you in the waiting room. And her mother said, what do you mean? She said, I saw you on your knees praying. And she said, I could hear your prayers. And her mother said, but I was praying silently. And Trisha said, you were praying this and this and this. And her mother was like, oh my gosh, how could you know that? And, she, and then Trisha said that she had the presence of mind to be kind of like a little scientist. And she said, as if she didn't know, where was my stepdad? You know, I saw dad standing next to you, but where was my stepdad? And her mother said, well, you know, this is a very awkward situation for him. Even though your father and I are divorced, you're our daughter. And it was your life at stake here. So we were kind of united in our concern for you. And your stepfather felt kind of awkward. So he went off and took a walk. And she said, oh, Trisha, you'll never believe this. When he came back, he was eating a candy bar. And Trisha said, I believe it. Because she saw it in her NDB. So those are, those are the kinds of um, stories, and those are not the only two in which veridical perception occurs. That really is, um, I can't think of a way to explain those perceptions, except that the person's consciousness really was, apart from their body, functioning. Can I say one story? Yeah. Another interesting story. A little girl dies instantly in the operation theater room, and then he comes back, she comes back to life. And when she came back, she described a bright light that surrounded her with love and compassion. It was very wonderful where she was. Uh, a lot of green, trees, heaven, heavenly, heaven place, yeah, very nice place. And then she said, there also was, um, well, the, the bright light asked me, do you want to go back or to stay here? And she said, well, I want to stay here, but this will upset my parents. So possibly I need to go back. There also was there my young brother holding me in his hands. And he, he was hugging me. I can explain everything from what I saw. The only thing I cannot explain is, who was that boy? I never had a brother. And then the mother and the father are looking at each other like that. Uh -uh. Should we tell her? And then they revealed to her that before she was born, she had a young brother that had, well, brother, not yet, a young boy, son, that died, and they never told her because they don't, didn't want to disappoint and upset her. And I know another story, and I will finish with this. There was a, a Indian girl, if I remember well her origin, who was traveling far from her, uh, the camp of her uh, uh, family. And there was a car accident and she's dying on the, on, the, on, the, on the road because the driver that hit her has left. And then a second car stops and tries to help her. And she says, don't worry, I'm okay. She was dying. Go back to the place where I live that was thousands of miles far from where she is now. And tell to my mother, your daughter is fine and she is going to meet her father, which means her mother's husband. <coughs> he goes back when this finished, to finish, to, to find the, her, her mother. And they are shocked when they identify that her father had died just two hours before she did. And this is at one 
other indication, well, one other symptom or feature that people that are dying, they are meeting relatives, a part of the, the bright light, that are kind, in a sense, are welcoming them to this other world. So she wasn't possible to know that her father had died two hours before her because she was thousands of miles far from the place where her father died. So, I mean, I, I don't really need to convince you. If you're interested, you can look into the literature yourself and, um, and judge for yourself whether you think the experiences are real or not. I do think it's important that um, as health professionals, we realize that the experience is real to the experiencer and that the after effects are undeniably real. There's been tons of research about after effects and that um, because those after effects are real and because they can be distressing to the person, um, as health professionals, we need to respond to them in a, in a really helpful way. And that's going to be the focus of our, the second part of our presentation. Um, I want to say one other thing. Uh, of all the near-death experiences that have been um, researched, uh, uh, I, we don't know for sure what the percentage is. But I'm going to say probably our best guess is that about 90% of NDEs are predominantly pleasurable. They're um, experiences of peace, joy, love, and that sort of thing. 10% approximately, as best we can extrapolate, are predominantly distressing. They're dominated by feelings of terror, horror, um, guilt, and um, confusion, those sorts of things, of nothingness. And um, just like we can't, research hasn't revealed the difference between people who do or don't report a near-death experience, they also haven't revealed the difference between people who have pleasurable or distressing experiences. And, but the interesting thing that's deaths and I noticed is that even though 6% of people said that the um, quality of their NDE was predominantly negative, if you remember that statistic, when we looked at the actual narratives of the, of the drowning NDEers, we did not find any characteristically distressing experiences. There were not experiences of um, going through the normal um, NDE features, but just not wanting to do it, and that's what makes it unpleasant. Or being out in an eternal void, absolutely alone, and hyper-aware forever. Uh, we never encountered that among a drown the drowning NDE narratives. So our working hypothesis right now, even though, I mean, it's a very small sample, but uh, is that possibly um, just Drowning NDEs are not distressing. Um, so, we, we, you know, as we do more research, we may come across some, but so far we haven't found any. So, cool. this is a good time for me. Yeah, I think it's not easy. I'm not sure if I missed it at the very beginning, but I wondered if you had any examples of people who had attempted suicide by drowning and whether mm -hmm. those experiences were different. Uh, I don't think that we, uh, any of our 35 cases were suicide by drowning. And interestingly, um, even the, the circumstances of death do not, are not related to the contents or the after effects of the NDE. So a person is just as likely to have a pleasurable experience as a result of a suicide attempt as they are if they um, are if their NDE results from illness or accident, injury. Um, but uh, we can't really say anything specifically about traveling. Yeah. You're talking about, I think, a single one-off NDEs. Have you considered multiple? Because in the case of, say, somebody who actually is ill, and say, terminally ill, would they experience possibly multiple NDEs leading up to Oh, yeah, it, um, the question is whether any individuals have had more than one near-death experience, and the answer is yes. And actually, those are folded into. We, we're in, we're um, including both individual and multiple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we really do need to take a break, right? Um, your bladders, if nothing else. Thank you very much. Thank you.